state of Israel as it is today is a reflection and a manifestation of its foundational document, Israel's Declaration of Independence. We hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel to be known as the State of Israel. It is the most significant and consequential sentence uttered by a Jew since antiquity. We hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel to be known as the State of Israel. The sentence that I've just read to you was proclaimed by David Ben-Gurion in Tel Aviv on Friday afternoon, May 14th, 1948, the 5th of Iyar, 5708. It is the most significant and consequential sentence uttered by a Jew since antiquity. It put an end to 2,000 years of dispersion and exile and announced the restoration of sovereign self-determination to the Jews over their own land. We hereby declare is the modern equivalent of the biblical hineni, an affirmation of presence and an assumption of responsibility. And it is the key passage in Israel's Declaration of Independence. If you're reprimanding yourself for not knowing enough about the Declaration, you are hardly alone. Uh, most Israelis, even educated ones, have only the foggiest notion of what it says. They might be familiar with a few fragments, but they don't have any sense of the content and the structure. Now, ironically, most can identify the document at a glance. The Declaration of Independence can be seen hanging on the walls, in government offices, in school classrooms throughout Israel, and in many Hebrew schools also in the United States. Usually what's on display is a facsimile reproduction of the parchment, with the Declaration written in a font reserved for sacred writing. A seal is attached as are the reproduced signatures of the 37 signers. To all of us who grew up in America, this reminds us of the facsimile reproductions of the American Declaration of Independence that we recall from childhood. You can identify such an object at a glance and even feel a certain familiarity with it without having any clear notion of what the text says, except perhaps for the more famous bits. Now, I admit that I was just such a person. I've lived in Israel for 36 years, and uh, I've been a professional historian for even longer. I knew some bits of the Declaration, which I'd encountered here and there, but I'd never given these 979 Hebrew words a deep read or asked much about the Declaration's genesis. I only took a deeper interest in it after a project I did last year on the circumstances surrounding the decision, the decision to declare independence. Now, between the UN partition plan approved by the General Assembly on November 29, 1947, and the anticipated end of the British mandate for Palestine on May 15, 1948, the Zionist leadership decided to declare independence. Under just what circumstances and by what mechanism 
are subjects that I'll leave for later. But the key focus of my study was the decision to declare. And my findings appeared in the April essay at Mosaic Magazine under the title, The May 1948 Vote That Made the State of Israel. The major finding of that study was that there really wasn't a decision to be made in May 1948. The Yishuv was primed for statehood. And as soon as Britain and the UN took their hands off Palestine, the Zionist leadership moved resolutely towards declaring statehood. The only real question was what sort of state to declare. And as I showed in that essay, the crucial issue for David Ben-Gurion was to declare the state without committing to its borders. The border issue was debated in the People's Administration, which is a kind of proto-government, on the very eve of independence. Ben-Gurion won a crucial vote on the matter when the People's Administration decided to omit, to omit any mention of the borders from the Declaration. But this was just one omission. And as I researched it, I asked myself another question. Had anything else been deliberately omitted from the Declaration? Indeed, who drafted the Declaration? On whose orders? And by what process? Who decided what went in and what went out? The Declaration of Independence is the most significant and consequential document composed by Jews since antiquity. Yet what did I know about how it came to be? Precious little, I had to admit, and so I began to investigate. It turned out to be an absolutely fascinating story, one of personalities, power struggles, and deliberations under fire. And that's the story I want to tell in this series. Before we do that, though, let me set the scene. We are at the former home of Tel Aviv's first mayor, Mayor Dizengoff, on Rothschild Boulevard. Today, it's known as Independence Hall. In 1948, it was the Tel Aviv Museum, which was an art museum. The date is May 14th. It's 4 p.m. Friday afternoon, just as the Sabbath approaches. For several days now, Zionist leaders and statesmen have been in a frenzy of activity. The British mandate will end on the Sabbath. The British were supposed to assist the UN Commission in implementing the partition plan, but they didn't. They even unilaterally moved up the date of their withdrawal. They've set it for May 15th, and the last British High Commissioner for Palestine, General Cunningham, has already boarded a ship in Haifa. The Union Jack is everywhere being lowered. In the resulting void, the Jewish state, as recommended by the UN General Assembly, is about to be born. Will the world applaud? Who will recognize it? most importantly, who will provide it with needed arms. For months, the country has been in turmoil. Since the UN resolution in November, there's been a civil war between Jews and Arabs in Palestine. The Jews have held their own, and then some, but at great cost. They've secured a chunk of the territory allotted to the Jewish state, but not all of it, in particular not the Negev, and they hold some of the territory allotted to the Arab state, such as Jaffa. But the Jews of Jerusalem, 100,000, are under siege, and the road is too perilous to send convoys to relieve them. The isolated Jerusalemites include 11 members of the People's Council, who should be, should be at the museum in Tel Aviv for the ceremony, but they're trapped in Jerusalem. And in the meantime, the settlers in the Etzion block near Jerusalem have been overrun by the Jordanian Arab Legion. Reports suggest that the defenders have been massacred by local Arabs. In the meantime, Arab armies are geared up to invade the country once the British decamp. There are already warnings that the Egyptian Air Force may bomb Tel Aviv. And the Jews, I remind you at this point, have no Air Force. Since nearly the entire Zionist leadership will attend the ceremony of the declaration they would present a tempting target. So invitations are issued at the very last minute. 
Everything is hush-hush. And there's no publication in the press about the place or the time. Under other circumstances, such a declaration would be made at the National Theater, Abima, in the large square which the theater overlooks. But that would be tempting fate. So the smallish museum has been chosen. Yet despite the secrecy and the absence of WhatsApp, Tel Aviv knows all the details and the streets around the museum soon fill. The members of the People's Council who are in Tel Aviv and who will be signers of the Declaration have met earlier in the afternoon at the Jewish National Fund building not far away to debate and to approve the Declaration. Ben-Goyen is in the chair. He's had only two hours of sleep and has already spent the morning with his military chiefs. He presents the Declaration and a debate ensues. On the first ballot, 16 of them vote for the Declaration, 8 abstain. Ben-Gurion then asks for a unanimous second ballot, and he gets it. The members now know what will be in the Declaration, and they have all agreed to sign it, despite reservations. They arrive and settle in to the museum hall. When Ben-Gurion's car pulls up, he emerges with his wife Paula, and a policeman salutes him. Ben-Gurion, in return, gives this sharp salute, captured on film, which will become one of the iconic images of the day. So the hall is now packed. It's standing room only. Ben-Gurion rises, strikes a gavel, and announces that he will now read the founding scroll of the new state. Now, there are different ways to divide the Declaration into parts. I've seen it divided into as many as seven or eight sections. But I'm going to stick with the conventional division used in Israel. And this splits the Declaration into four sections. Historical preamble, the proclamation, principles of the state, and appeals to the world. At the conclusion of these four sections comes the affixing of the signatures. I think it's important at this point that we read the Declaration from start to finish. We'll come back to segments of the text, but let's experience it as it was meant to be experienced as a single document from beginning to end. Eretz Yisrael was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Here, their spiritual, religious, and political identity was shaped. Here, they first attained to statehood, created cultural values of national and universal significance, and gave to the world the eternal Book of Books. After being forcibly exiled from their land, the people kept faith with it throughout their dispersion, and never ceased to pray and hope for their return to it and for the restoration in it of their political freedom. Impelled by this historic and traditional attachment, Jews strove in every successive generation to re-establish themselves in their ancient homeland. In recent decades, they returned in their masses. Pioneers, ma'apilim, and defenders, they made deserts bloom, revived the Hebrew language, built villages and towns, and created a thriving community, controlling its own economy and culture, loving peace, but knowing how to defend itself bringing the blessings of progress to all the country's inhabitants and aspiring towards independent nationhood. In the year 5657, at the summons of the spiritual father of the Jewish state, Theodore Herzl, the first Zionist Congress convened and proclaimed the right of the Jewish people to national rebirth in its own country. This right was recognized in the Balfour Declaration of the 2nd of November, 1917 and reaffirmed in the mandate of the League of Nations, which, in particular, gave international sanction to the historic connection between the Jewish people and Eretz Israel, and to the right of the Jewish people to rebuild its national home. The catastrophe which recently befell the Jewish people, the massacre of millions of Jews in Europe, was another clear demonstration of the urgency of solving the problem of its homelessness by re-establishing in Eretz Israel the Jewish state, which would open the gates of the homeland wide to every Jew and confer upon the Jewish people 
the status of a fully privileged member of the Committee of Nations. Survivors of the Nazi Holocaust in Europe, as well as Jews from other parts of the world, continued to migrate to Eretz Israel undaunted by difficulties, restrictions, and dangers, and never ceased to assert their right to a life of dignity, freedom, and honest toil in their national homeland. In the Second World War, the Jewish community of this country contributed its full share to the struggle of the freedom and peace-loving nations against the forces of Nazi wickedness, and by the blood of its soldiers and its war effort, gained the right to be reckoned among the peoples who founded the United Nations. On the 29th of November 1947, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution calling for the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel. The General Assembly required the inhabitants of Eretz Israel to take such steps as were necessary on their part for the implementation of that resolution. This recognition by the United Nations of the right of the Jewish people to establish their state is irrevocable. This right is the natural right of the Jewish people to be masters of their own fate, like all other nations, in their own sovereign state. Accordingly, we, members of the People's Council, representatives of the Jewish community of Eretz Israel and of the Zionist movement, are here assembled on the day of the termination of the British mandate over Eretz Israel, and by virtue of our natural and historic right, and on the strength of the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly, hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel to be known as the State of Israel. We declare that with effect from the moment of the termination of the mandate being tonight, the Eve of Shabbat, the 6th of Iyar, 5708, until the establishment of the elected regular authorities of the state in accordance with the Constitution, which shall be adopted by the elected Constituent Assembly, not later than October 1st, 1948, the People's Council shall act as a Provisional Council of State, and its executive organ, the People's Administration, shall be the Provisional Government of the Jewish State, to be called Israel. The State of Israel will be open for Jewish immigration and for the ingathering of the exiles. It will foster the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants. It will be based on freedom justice, and peace, as envisaged by the prophets of Israel, it will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. It will safeguard the holy places of all religions, and it will be faithful to the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. The State of Israel is prepared to cooperate with the agencies and representatives of the United Nations in implementing the resolution of the General Assembly of the 29th of November 1947 and will take steps to bring about the economic union of the whole of Eretz Israel. We appeal to the United Nations to assist the Jewish people in the building up of its state and to receive the State of Israel into the Committee of Nations. We appeal in the very midst of the onslaught launched against us now for months to the Arab inhabitants of the State of Israel to preserve peace and participate in the upbuilding of the state on the basis of full and equal citizenship and due representation in all its provisional and permanent institutions. We extend our hand to all neighboring states and their peoples in an offer of peace and good neighborliness and appeal to them to establish bonds of cooperation and mutual help with the sovereign Jewish people settled in its own land. The State of Israel is prepared to do its share in a common effort for the advancement of the entire Middle East. We appeal to the Jewish people throughout the diaspora to rally round the Jews of Eretz Israel in the tasks of immigration and upbuilding and to stand by them in the great struggle for the realization of the age-old dream, the redemption of Israel. Placing our trust in the Rock of Israel, we affix our signatures to this proclamation at this session of the Provisional Council of State on the soil of the homeland in the city of Tel Aviv on this Sabbath Eve, the fifth day of Iyar, 5708.
When Ben-Gurion finished uh, reading the declaration, Rabbi Fishman Maimon, who was a member of the People's Council, uh, recited the Shehechianu, the blessing of thanksgiving, and many of the participants remembered it as the most moving aspect of the proceedings. Baruch Hata Adonai, Eyeinu Melech Olam, Shehechianu Mikananu Mizanu Lazman Azai. The present members of the People's Council then came up, one by one, to sign the parchment in alphabetical order. Moshe Shertok, who was the um, de facto foreign minister of uh, the new state, held it as each signed his name. And blank space was left for the members who couldn't be there. They could sign later. Some in the audience now expected a speech. This is, after all, a Zionist meeting. Uh, but then strains of Hatikva descended from the second floor of the building into which the Philharmonic Orchestra had been crammed. After the anthem, Ben-Gurion made this announcement. The State of Israel has arisen. This session is adjourned. The ceremony had lasted a little more than half an hour. The parchment was taken off for safekeeping into the vault of the Anglo-Palestine Bank, later Bank Lumi. The next morning, Tel Aviv had a taste of what was to come when Egyptian Spitfire aircraft bombed the city. So you've had a first read of the Declaration. As we shall see, it was written in haste under the dual pressures of a deadline and a war. It was a controversial document from the very outset. Even some of its signers thought it flawed sometimes deeply so. The structure, the content, and the style met with criticism from different and sometimes opposing corners. And it's true that had the authors had another few hours or days or weeks, they might have produced a different statement. But what's remarkable is that its authors nonetheless did produce a lasting declaration in such difficult conditions. And by lasting, I mean that it still resonates deeply with Israelis and Jews 70 years later. Now we'll pose these questions in depth very shortly, but by way of a preface, let me emphasize what this lecture series is not. Uh, the year 1948, the year of Israel's birth, was a cascade of dramatic and decisive events. This was above all a year of war, both between Jews and Arabs in Palestine and then between Israel and neighboring Arab states. The famous books about that year are all military histories. Think about Dan Kurtzman's Genesis 1948, and Dominique Lapierre and Larry Collins' O Jerusalem, and Benny Morris's book, 1948. It was also a year of masses of people on the move, the Jewish refugees from Europe, whose saga would be immortalized by Leon Uris in his novel Exodus, and the flight of the Palestinian Arab refugees. In most accounts of 1948, the drama of the war overshadows everything else. The Declaration of Independence is a brief interlude in the unfolding epic of sacrifice, courage, and suffering of the war. It receives a few pages at most, and these focus on the drama surrounding the event itself, while the text is barely mentioned. I'm going to assume that you know that history, at least in its broad outlines. In what follows, the war recedes into the background, and the Declaration assumes the foreground. And the text of the Declaration takes priority over the drama of its proclamation. Now, it would be very easy to regale you with backstories about May 14th, 1948, and I promise to tell a few when appropriate. But in the end, they fade away. They become anecdotes. What's left from that day is the Declaration itself. What lives is the text. Let me say what else this series will not be. It isn't a deep dive into the history of the drafting of the Declaration. <clears throat> it's a very complicated story. It's been sorted out brilliantly by Professor Yoram Shahal. For us to do the same would require a seminar format with text opposite text, draft by draft. In my second lecture, I'll outline for you the key stages in the drafting because major changes in the text arose from decisions in the drafting stages. It's also important to know 
who made which changes, up to and including David Ben-Goyon himself. But we won't go from draft to draft in a forensic exercise of comparison. So what will we do? First, in my next lecture, uh, we'll consider some of the overall characteristics of the Declaration. Now, if you know your American Declaration of Independence, you'll have sensed that Israel's is different. There's some overlap, but the substance and the style are different. The Israeli document doesn't breathe fire against anyone. Indeed, is it even a declaration of independence? If so, independence from whom? We'll consider the peculiar political circumstances that gave the Declaration its peculiar character. We'll then read the Declaration for what it tells us about five themes. For each theme, each the subject of one lecture, we'll look at what the Declaration says and doesn't say. Whether there was an issue of principle or politics that arose in the drafting stage and the way the text has been interpreted at various points over the past 70 years. Let me say right now what those five themes are. The first, identity. Who were they and who are we? By who were they I mean who actually declared the state and by what authority and in whose name? By who are we I mean what is the identity of the entity being declared? It was a Jewish state in the land of Israel. But what did Jewish state mean to those who wrote the Declaration? And by who are we? I ask what we learn about the identity of the new state from its name, Israel, and why that name, at the last moment, was ultimately preferred over other options. The second, religion. If people know any of any one dispute over the Declaration of Independence, it's the debate over whether or not to mention God. That debate spilled out into the public at the time, and it was famously resolved by mention of Tzur Yisrael, the Rock of Israel, in this concluding passage, placing our trust in Tzur Yisrael, the Rock of Israel, we affix our signatures to this proclamation. Now we know the story of the basic tension in this passage, Ben-Goyon wanted a formula that could be signed by both an atheistic communist and an orthodox Jew. Tzur Yisrael was an ambiguous compromise. And we'll look at this episode. But there are other passages that involve choices about the role of divine promise in the rights of the Jewish people to the land. As a general statement, the earliest drafts made the most references to God with each successive draft these references were deleted or elided. And yet, Tzur Yisrael made the cut. So, is the Declaration of Independence a secular document? Third, legitimacy. How did Israel's founders express in words the legitimate claim of the Jews to statehood? What was the mix of historic, religious, and legal claims that the Declaration put forth? Which ones were directed internally? which externally, and why were some kinds of claims preferred over others? In particular, how much significance should we attach to international legitimacy in the Declaration? As I mentioned, this is where I began my engagement with the document. The Declaration refers six times to the United Nations, mostly in connection with UN General Assembly Resolution 181, recommending the partition of Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. Earlier drafts not only cited the UN resolution, but affirmed that the state would be established in the borders specified on the map of the partition plan. In the end, however, all mention of the borders dropped after a very close vote in the People's Administration. That wasn't all. A reference made in the final draft to the UN plan as a partition plan, as a partition plan, was cut at Ben-Gurion's insistence. I'll review for you how and why borders and the word partition were dropped from the Declaration. What does the absence of any territorial references suggest? Did the Declaration commit Israel to any territorial limits or configuration? Or to accepting an Arab state in Eretz Israel? The fourth, rights. Collective, individual, political. 
It's usually assumed that the Declaration proclaimed Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. In fact, the word democratic doesn't appear in the text. This wasn't just a matter of careless omission. It appeared in earlier drafts of the Declaration, but was deleted. Why? And what passages in the Declaration could be read as effectively insisting that Israel would be democratic? So much so that subsequent basic laws of Israel claim that the Declaration constituted Israel not only as a Jewish, but as a democratic state. And what of individual rights? Israel's Declaration, like America's, justifies the state in terms of upholding the rights of its prospective citizens. But which rights? If you're American, you may not remember anything from the Declaration of Independence except this phrase. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Israel's declaration makes numerous references to rights, and they also underwent an evolution in prior drafts. What's significant is that all but one refer to collective rights of the Jewish people. What does this say about how the founders understood rights in the first half of the 20th century? When Israel's Supreme Court, in the second half, expanded individual rights on the basis of the Declaration's principles, were they true to it? And what were the aspirations and apprehensions behind the discussion of collective Arab rights in the Declaration? Now, the fifth and the last theme is law. If this were a lecture series on the American Declaration of Independence, this last lecture wouldn't even be necessary. The American Declaration served an immediate political purpose, it would be the Bill of Rights and the Constitution that would serve as the foundation of American law. Something similar was supposed to happen in Israel. Its declaration promised a convening within six months of a constituent assembly to draw up a constitution. But because of the war and post-war politics, this never happened. In the absence of a constitution, a declaration never meant to serve as the basis of law became a kind of quasi-constitution, retroactively invested with legal standing. Far from being only a historical document, it has become a presence in contemporary debates, especially over rights. Has the declaration stood up to this test? Is it really the ultimate bulwark of the Jewish and democratic state? These then are the topics I intend to cover. As you'll gather, they include issues which to this day are among the most vexing and controversial surrounding Israel. Religion, borders, democracy, rule of law, rights, Zionism. The Declaration raises a host of questions, not all of which it answers unequivocally, partly because of the need to find internal consensus and partly because of the need to satisfy international opinion. Jurists read and reread the document in the search for answers and to discover intent. But another way to read it is as a contingent document for what it tells us about a moment in the history of Israel. It was a defining moment, a point where every decision and every word had fateful consequences, but it was still a moment. We'll now be heading towards that moment back in time 70 years to the day of Israel's rebirth. But let me end this introductory lecture with a story about that day. I can show you a few moments in a film clip of Ben-Goyen reading the Declaration, and there is an audio of Ben-Goyen reading the entire Declaration. But what I can't show you is a film clip of him reading the whole thing. Now why? After all, by 1948, we're in the age of the mass media. True, the radio still rules. Now, when Churchill and Roosevelt wanted to reach their audiences quickly, they did it via the radio. For some famous speeches, in fact, we have only audio. A prime example is Churchill's The Darkest Hour speech. But we're also in the era of film and newsreels in the cinema. From 1933, for example, we have full filmed versions of Hitler's first speech as chancellor and Roosevelt's first inaugural address. And we do have many films of famous speeches in the war years, including Roosevelt's so-called infamy speech in Congress right after Pearl Harbor. So why don't we have a full film 
of Ben-Gurion declaring Israel's independence. The answer says something about the improvised nature of the whole thing. The audio recording wasn't going to be a problem. A recording was made in the museum. Listeners, by the way, also made recordings from the live radio broadcast. But the only moving picture camera at the May 14th ceremony belonged to a cinematographer, one Nathan Axelrod, who owned a company that produced weekly newsreels. The Jewish agency commissioned him at the last minute to film the great occasion. But he had only four minutes of film in stock to cover a ceremony which was expected to last half an hour. So Ben-Gurion arranged to give Axelrod signals and nods at the most important points in the proceedings so that Axelrod would know when to roll the camera. Now, after the ceremony, the Jewish agency press handlers cut up the original negative into four parts and sent them out to various news agencies for use in newsreels so that less than a minute of the original survived in Israel. There are some other bits that were given to Reuters and uh, uh, also exist. And later, the sound was overlaid on this fragment. But if you watch it closely, you'll see that there is no synchronization between Ben-Gurion's lips and his words. Um, so we do have Ben-Gurion's voice, and we also have some excellent still photographs. Uh, one of the world's most famous photographers, Robert Kappa, uh, shot the ceremony. But the absence of a good film version has had two effects. First, it creates a certain distance between us and the Declaration, as if it were something from another era, not ours. But it was a different era in the history of the world and in the history of the Jews. It was an era of desperation, uncertainty, and hope in the few years between the horrors of the Holocaust and the resurrection of Israel. And if the new state couldn't organize a 15-minute film of its most historic moment, think of how difficult it must have been to fight a battle for survival with scraps of outdated technology left over from another war. The fragmentary state of the film is a reminder we have to understand the founders in their own time. The certitude and security we enjoy today and the interconnectedness were utterly alien to them. Second, in the absence of a good film, the words written and spoken loom large. They certainly will in this series. These lectures are being filmed at a much higher quality and resolution than the most formative moment in the history of Israel. And my hosts deem this as an effective way to transmit the content. But there should be before you, at all times, the text of the Declaration. My spoken words will respond to it, illuminate it, extract from it, and contextualize it. We'll be jumping between the words of the Declaration and my words. Of course, you can also watch me, if you like. But my advice is to listen to me while keeping your eyes on the text. Thank you, and that concludes my first lecture. <laughs> The denial by the British mandate of its purpose grew and grew and became in the last 10 years the basis of Britain's policy in the East. Instead of assisting the immigration of Jews to their national home, the gates were closed before the persecuted of our people. 